Okay, we're ready? So we left off with nosocomial infections last time. So we started to mention these because our, our last one we've been talking about were carriers, we're talking about reservoirs. These all go hand in hand with breaking chains of infections, and that's a term that is used in hospital settings. And remember, an effect, an infection, an infection, there we go, not an infection, but an infection it, at a hospital is referred to as a nosocomial infection, meaning that we ended up getting exposed while we were in a hospital setting. Is this the same slide that everybody's on? Are we getting the slides? Okay, good. All right. So there's an estimate out there that about 5 to 15 percent of all hospital patients become exposed to and come home with a nosocomial infection. So the idea is I go in for surgery, maybe um, during the surgery I have to be intubated or something, and then when I wake up, I don't take my deep breaths to clear out my lungs, and now I end up with pneumonia. Um, maybe I go in for knee surgery and I get exposed to something and now I have MRSA. So it's where I went in with something, I come out with something different. Hospitals work really hard to prevent nosocomial infections for several reasons. One is patient care and reputation, so they want to make sure the patients know that they're safe to go to. The other one is insurance. If they have a patient who gets a nosocomial infection, the insurance company will not pay for it. It is on the hospital to treat and pay for it. So it is very important for a hospital to be able to prove that they did everything possible to make sure that they did not um, expose a patient. So with this in mind then, the reason that hospitals do tend to be kind of a hot spot for infection is because we kind of have this trilogy of the perfect storm. So you have a chain of transmission, meaning that you have a likely chance of having things that are dirty or that have bacteria on them. You have people coming in who are sneezing and coughing all the time, so it's hard to keep everything clean. You have microorganisms in the hospital environment. So as people come in and sneeze, they're spreading viruses, they're spreading bacteria. So it's kind of like a common ground for all these organisms. And we have compromised hosts. We have patients that are coming in that are sick, run down, ill, or after a surgery, they've been through major stress. These all kind of merge together, and in the middle, they make that nosocomial infection more likely. Now, when we look at what are the most likely nosocomial infections, the one that really jumps out are the UTIs. So the UTIs make up about a 40% rate. So of that 5 to 15%, 40% of those will be UTI infections. And that's usually because of the use of catheters. So if you have a catheter in your urethra, you have a foreign body in an area that's usually sterile, you have a chance of bacteria getting in through there, and then unfortunately that will result in UTI. The next one is surgical site infections. So just anytime you have an opening or a wound, it makes sense that you might have bacteria trying to take advantage of that. This would be, for example, where we'd see opportunistic bacteria where they would jump in there. And then the other one, the third one, is the lower respiratory infections. And again, that's caused from not breathing deeply after a surgery. Um, when you're put to sleep for surgery or when you're under anesthesia, you take shallower breaths. And so that allows fluid to accumulate in your lungs. That's why when you wake up, they have the spirometers nearby to have you practice, you know, blowing and breathing in through the spirometers and bouncing the little bubble ball inside. It's to try to get people to breathe deeply and clear out those alveoli so that they don't have any fluid to accumulate. So who can tell me one factor that results in a nosocomial infection? Compromised host. Compromised host. Excellent. Compromised host. That was those three that we just saw overlapping. What was another one? Yeah, chain of transmission. And then the last one was bacteria, source bacteria. What is a compromised host? If somebody said, what does that mean? What would you say? Someone who's more at risk. Someone who's more at risk. Perfect. Yeah, compromised host is somebody who maybe is sick or they have a lower immune system. So they are already running the gamut of having a higher risk just from being present in a hospital. So let's talk about some of our emerging infectious diseases that are out there. And we kind of mentioned several in the beginning in our very first lecture together in chapter one. These are a few more that kind of are evolving or emerging because of genetic changes or because of human activity changes. 
So a lot of times when we see new diseases emerge, it's because they've had some sort of a genetic new combination or a genetic change. So for example, with E. coli, E. coli 0157 used to be normal E. coli, but it ended up getting a gene from the bacterium Shigella. And both of these are gammas. Remember, we have these both in our gamma proteobacters. They talk to each other. Shigella had this, this really nasty toxic plasmid in it. It makes us sick when we're exposed to it. And this E. coli that used to be harmless picked up that plasmid and changed forever to become O. E. coli 0157. 0157 is referring to the protein that it now makes, so it's a toxin. That's why I have those numbers and letters out for it. Um, if you work with E. coli, uh, these strains are very, you know, carefully um, controlled in laboratory settings. For example, when I used to work in a lab, I had to get fingerprinted to work with them. Um, I worked with a lot of different hemorrhagic strains and things like that, and so I'd have to go and get fingerprinted to be able to purchase the strains or to work with them. Um, and we would use them as controls to test with patients. Also, when organisms pick up plasmids, they have the chance of picking up antibiotic resistance. So we've talked about MRSA in here, how it's resistant because it has mutated and picked up a gene that makes it resistant. But we're also seeing changes in genetics because of changes in the globe. So for example, right now we're seeing that our weather patterns are changing. And again, we can argue about what's causing them, but we know that they are occurring. That's the truth. And so with dry conditions, we're seeing viruses or things emerge that we hadn't seen before. Um, one of the ones that's been on the rise since the 90s is the Hanta virus. Do you guys know the Hanta virus? Have you heard of that? There was an outbreak in Yosemite not too long ago. Hanta is a virus that's carried by rodents. And it's carried specifically by mice. And it's one that is easily airborne. So if you find mice droppings in your house, you automatically go to sweep them up, maybe. And if you sweep them up, it aerosolizes, and now you can breathe in this virus, and it causes a potentially deadly respiratory infection. So if you ever find mouse droppings in your home, you want to get a vacuum and suck them up rather than sweep, so that way you don't create aerosols. We're very fortunate here. It's not quite dry or hot enough for hantavirus, but we are seeing it more in like Four Corners, Yellowstone, um, Yosemite again had an outbreak. So we are seeing it more and more as the dry conditions occur. The reason dryness affects it is that what we see is that we'll have a pattern of rain, which brings grass. The grass then starts to dry out and create seeds. The mice come in and their populations boom because they have more food. Then when it becomes dry and the grass disappears, the mice start starving and they go into homes looking for food. So that's why there's this connection with dryness. The mice are going into houses trying to find a water source. The other one we see is wildlife trade. So, you know, as we discussed, SARS and COVID most likely came from bats. And whether it was engineered or not, we know for sure SARS was not engineered, that was natural. It came from um, wild bats that were being sold as food source. And they were being sold in animal markets, and the animal markets are not any kind of place you want to buy food from. Um, you'll have animals stacked in cages, they're not being fed or watered, so they're dying. So you'll find one animal that's dead, and underneath it, another animal. And so it's just one of those things where they're all stuck in together, and so now you have animals decaying with living animals right beside them. It's just a breeding ground of bacteria. So it's definitely something that can lead to a lot of infection. Modern transportation. So modern transportation is something that is causing the spread of viruses to occur quickly and globally. Used to, because it was so hard to move from one continent to another, if somebody wanted to travel, for example, from Europe to North America, they'd have to go on a ship. And that travel would take about three weeks. If you had something contagious, you would definitely know it during your travels and you would be isolated. And if you died from your contagion, you'd be tossed overboard. I mean, that was just kind of the way it was. Nowadays, you can hop on an airplane and you can travel quickly. And if you're infectious, you can carry that infectious agent with you and expose everybody around you on the airplane. So it's a concern because it's so much easier for people to travel. We see the effect of this because we watch new viruses come in. West Nile virus, if you guys remember the map we showed way back in chapter one, it started in the East Coast in New York, 
and then it just quickly spread to the West Coast within about two years. We would never have seen that before without you know travel being so easy now. Um, ecological disasters. So anytime you have wars, people being dislocated, stress, all of the things that goes hand in hand with that, you have increased with disease. Um, also, we're seeing that with our own um, situations where we have too many people coming into areas, we're now trying to build more homes. We're expanding into areas that have never been developed. We're stirring up dust, we're stirring up dirt for housing projects. With that, a lot of times we're stirring up new fungal spores in the soil. And that's where we get things like valley fever or coxipoides. Um, we didn't see that before until we started branching our houses out. And now as we start to build in more areas, we're stirring up more dust and dirt and we're stirring up those fungals. Uh, migration of humans and animals in new places. So as um, people, for example, like in Africa, they're trying to find food, their population numbers are going up. They then switch to new food sources. So start eating bats, start eating any animal they can catch. Um, Ebola came from bats. And so we know that they were hunting bats in caves and that's how they got exposed. HIV, we suspect that it came from um, the animal trade involving monkeys. Um, we think that monkeys were being caught and being used for food, also being sold for research. And probably what happened is because simian HIV is so similar to humans, we think that during one of those catching things, a monkey must have bit somebody and that had blood saliva contamination and so the HIV was able to transport. If we, let's say we never went into those type of environments and exploited them, mm -hmm. would we, would Ebola just sit quietly and still learn and adapt to everything even though it's never been exposed? So it's Ebola still? would not have evolved to work with us. So if it never gets around a human, it doesn't evolve to try to get into a new host. So it would have stayed specific for bats. What we see is when you get a new host that's being exposed to a virus consistently, that virus starts figuring out pretty fast, like, oh, if I just have this little mutation, I can fit in a cell. And so it has a random mutation that'll occur, and, and now it can fit into a cell. And so that's how they can mutate to attack people. And it's, it's not like they're really consciously thinking of it. It's just that their viruses replicate so quickly and they mutate so easily that it's a higher chance of them being able to now evolve to where they fit with us. But if we're not going around, then we don't have to worry about the numbers trying to evolve to with us. They're happy with the host that they have. We're referred to a lot of times as an accidental host, meaning that we were never meant to be a part of their life cycle. We just kind of got in the way. And then one of the other ones is public health failure with trying to have people not get so political and to also trust in vaccines more. We really kind of lost control of the situation in the public health Part of that is because when there was first a lot of rumors going around about not getting vaccines, public health officials just assumed that those would burn out. They were like, oh, you know, people know better. They, you know, we, we've seen the effectiveness of it. People are safe nowadays. They forgot that it's a short-term memory thing. People forget what life really could be like. So unfortunately, there wasn't a huge push against, you know, educate or push for education with vaccines in the early days. And now we've gone to a point where it's like the pendulum swung so far, everything that they've published just kind of gets shot down. So they're trying to figure out ways to really encourage people to start trusting in the science again. Um, part of that I really think needs to be more education to make sure that they address concerns and to listen to people. I see a lot on both sides where they're arguing with each other, but nobody's listening. It's that thing where you know sometimes you just need to be quiet and listen to what people are trying to say. Yeah. Do you think it's because people want a hundred percent? It's going to fix everything. I'll never get it, and they don't realize that you're never going to ever ever going to get a hundred percent. This is going right. to fit. It's not going to fit in the box. Right. And and unfortunately with life, nothing's a hundred percent. We have cars break down. We have you know clothes rip and tear over time. I mean, so it's, it's that idea that science is magic and it can fix everything, and it's not. We can help, but we can't fix it all. But we can definitely help with it. So because of that, we are seeing increases in new diseases or old diseases are coming back, and so there is definitely a concern. So list two reasons why emerging infections could occur. So we just talked about a whole bunch of them. What was one of them? Yeah, from stress, traveling into stress and stress. What would be another one? 
Yeah, spreading out houses in the back, Rachel, did you have? Oh, I thought you said something. Okay, Chris, what did you say? Uh, ecological disasters. Ecological disasters. Yeah, exactly. So here's what I'd like to ask. And again, I don't have an answer. It's kind of like vaccinations. You know, I don't, I definitely don't want to try to push you into anything. And this one is always kind of just an interesting one I like to know. Um, do you think stricter travel enforcement should be set? Do you think people should have their temperatures taken before they fly? Do you think that people should have some sort of a health screening before they fly? Or do you think they're pretty good the way they are? What do you guys think? They're pretty good? Yeah. Yes, they are. They are trying to, now that COVID's here, they're trying to check temperatures more. But let me ask you this, is temperature checking effective? No. No, and why isn't it? You may not have a fever at the time. If you've taken Tylenol or ibuprofen, your fever is dropped. The other thing is they've had families get turned down for traveling with children who are between the ages of, you know, a few months to two because their child had a fever and they were teething. Mm -hmm. So a teething fever is not anything contagious, and anybody who's had kids knows how those work. It's fussy, you know, pulling at their teeth, you know, thing, or their cheeks, things like that. And it was obvious that they were teething, but they were denied travel. So again, it's kind of hard because there's always gray areas. So yeah, I'm always just curious about that, you know, like what, what would be the best travel enforcement? And to be honest, I don't even know. Yeah. Um, why are they also denied in like Denied, like they're taking their temperatures and well, kicking like, them out. My baby Matthew had a fever, and they didn't tease him because he was COVID symptoms. Right. So, and that's again, that's frustrating too because it could have been teething, it could have been a cold, it could have been anything. And that's, and you're right, they shouldn't be denying them. Well, they should. It's frustrating because like the healthcare should take care of it. Yes, I agree. And what they should do is if you have a child come in that has a fever, they should isolate. That way they're not, because remember, a fever means they're contagious and spreading. But that's okay. You can still isolate that child, keep them away or not in the general waiting room, but still treat, right? I mean, you don't want to turn people away. That's not okay, you know? So I feel your frustration with that. It's like, yeah. And the problem is right now with COVID, it's like we have this long list of symptoms and anybody comes in saying their stomach hurts. It's like, oh, that's COVID, go home. It's like, well, no, I really don't think it is. You know, you go in with a fever, oh, that's COVID, go home. So it's, it is, it's like we've gone too far again. Our pendulum is going too far. So let's talk about epidemiology and the study that epidemiologists are able to perform to try to figure out different patterns of diseases. So if you were an epidemiologist, that means that you're studying the where, the when, the why, the how of a disease, and basically trying to figure out how it occurs and try to help stop its spread. So the epidemiologists out there want to know some major information. They want to know who is involved. So in other words, is it a farmer? Is it a healthcare worker? Is it a UPS driver? Like who is it? What's their job? What's their function? because that's gonna help us figure out maybe where they got exposed. They wanna know what the case is. So what are the symptoms? What are the signs? They wanna know all of that information. They wanna know where and when they got exposed, how long they've been sick. And they wanna know any risk factors. Were they doing anything before they started to get sick? Um, were they you know, maybe traveling to another country? Were they in a hospital? What happened to them before they got sick? And they'll take this data and depending on what kind of epidemiologist they are, they'll use this data to generate some answer. So you can have descriptive study epidemiologists who are going to study the who, the what, the when, and the where. And so these are going to be epidemiologists that are basically going to be looking for patterns of disease. These are ones that are going to be looking for where diseases are, when they're present, if there's seasonal dispersal. Um, so try to figure out what kind of patterns they see. You can have analytical epidemiologists, and they're asking more of the why and the how. So these analytical studies are usually done after breakouts occurred, and they're comparing results with a control group. Or they're setting up a control group, or maybe they're going to give somebody a treatment for being exposed to a virus and another group not, and then compare those studies. So analytical tends to be more of a controlled study or where we're gathering data and just crunching numbers. Descriptive tends to be more in the field. 
So as things are developing, that's when you're having descriptive occur. Okay. So we can do this a couple of ways. We can monitor data and reports from doctors. Those are those morbidity and mortality reports. We can be out in the field. So the CDC, I mentioned, has representatives in almost every country to serve as a in-field person. Um, so they have active field surveillance. And then this is an interesting one, and they started doing this with COVID, is one that's called a serological screen. And this is where they started looking, for example, with COVID at things like blood donations. They started looking at the antibodies in their blood donors to see if they had been exposed to COVID. And we found out that COVID was here a lot earlier than we realized. So for example, we had blood donors from December, November who were showing signs of antibodies. In China, they had blood uh, donors that were in September showing signs of antibodies. Yeah, Laura. If someone's infected, would they share blood like with other person? Mm-hmm. Same like that. So good question. So the way the antibodies work is that if you have an active infection, I'll find antibodies circulating in your blood. But once the active infection has been cleared, then what's going to happen is I'm not going to see antibodies circulating until you get exposed. So if, for example, you get a shot, and then now you go in and you do a blood donation, I didn't have an active infection, so I'm not going to see antibodies. But if I'm currently sick with COVID and I don't know it and I donate blood, I will see antibodies. Does that make sense? So the antibodies are present if you're fighting it currently. I just mean like, so like... If a mom who's breastfeeding gets a vaccine, she gives the baby the antibody for it, or does the same thing as blood? Great question. So, are antibodies passed in breast milk? So, it really depends on what kind of antibodies they are. There are studies that are showing right now that COVID antibodies are passing in breast milk. So, they are encouraging women to breastfeed because it is giving natural immunity to their children. Yeah. Um, I also saw a study that um, someone that was pregnant, she got the vaccine, and then when she gave birth, they found antibodies from the umbilical cord. Yes. So she passed it through. Yes. And so that's one of the reasons why originally they were telling women who were pregnant not to get the shot because they weren't sure what the reactions would be. As they've gathered more data, they're now telling them to get the shot because it will pass to their infant. The thing about that and the reason they had to wait is not all antibodies are the same. And we get different antibodies for different viruses. And some of them are able to process and pass the placenta, and some aren't. And some are able to process and pass through breast milk, and some aren't. Did that answer your question? Okay. So since you can get like the antibody test, mm -hmm. how do they test it if it's not like, active in your blood? Because you go to like blood donation. Right. So when you're getting an antibody test, they're seeing if you've been recently exposed, and they're doing a count that way. And they're looking for a, they're looking for memory cells. They're looking for a different type of an antibody, oh. not an active circulating. And we're going to talk about those when we talk about our immunity. So it'll make more sense. There's different types of antibodies out there. Okay. So it's a different tracer. Yeah, Aaron is back. Yeah, so what is the antigen testing for? So an antigen is when you're basically, you're, yeah, you have blood, and I put a drop of something on the blood to see if you have antibodies present. If you do, I'll see a coagulation of the blood. So I'll see like kind of a dotting or spotting. So I can do that, for example, if you're sick and I think maybe you have salmonella typhi, I'll do a antigen test to see if your antibodies are for salmonella. So um, it's the same as the antibody test. Exactly. Same exact thing. The it's antibody right. test is looking for an antibody. An antigen test is seeing if your antibody reacts to an antigen. So is there a benefit of one or the other? Nope. No benefit. They're, they're testing the exact same thing, just different terms. And we'll, like I said, we'll cover this in our immunity chapters, and all of this will make more sense when you see it in front of you, because you'll see the different antibodies, and you'll see how the testing works. Great question. But yeah, and there's not one that's better than another. The serological screening is a really interesting one, too, though, because we can use it for not just COVID. We can use it to see things like measles spread. We can use this to see things like... Um, different types of salmonella, everything we've been exposed to. It's really interesting to see what's in our blood. So some of the places where we can gather data on diseases, as I mentioned, is the CDC. That's the one we use here. But pretty much everywhere you go, you're going to have some sort of healthcare system that's watching over their nation that they're in charge of. So for example, Canada has a system that's similar to CDC for Health Canada. We have the World Health Organization, where we have a bunch of people working together. We have the Europa, the European Commission, um, Health Protection Agency, and then Doctors Without Borders. 
they all share their data together. So the idea is that you will find something and share it in a database so that everybody can keep track of where diseases are active and we can keep track of how serious an outbreak is at the time. So it's, it's kind of a trust system. We're trusting countries to let us know when things are going well or when things are going okay. So epidemiology then first came about through the work of a few pioneers. So the three main pioneers that kind of shaped the foundation of the types of epidemiology that we use are Ignis Samuelize, John Snow, and Florence Nightingale. And Samuelize was one of the first people who helped spread something called feral fever, which was also referred to as childbirth fever. And he did a why and how study, an analytical study. So what he did is he compared women in his hospital and he looked to see who got sick and who didn't after childbirth. And then he looked to see what their doctors had done and what processes were used during the birth. And what he found was that women who went home without childbirth fever or puerperal fever had had doctors who had washed their hands and who had clean lab coats on. So he basically was helping to prove what Lister had proved. And he compiled this data and went to his hospital officials, presented the data, and they agreed that from that point on, all doctors should wash their hands. Then he went forward and presented it in multiple regions of, his region of where he lived, and other hospitals started doing this as well. John Snow, we're going to talk about what he did. He was the first person who ever stopped an outbreak. He stopped a cholera outbreak in uh, London that was just decimating the city. And he was able to do research to figure out what was causing the outbreak and then figure out what the source of the outbreak was. So he's credited with being like a true first epidemiologist. And then, of course, Florence Nightingale, we've all heard of her. She's kind of the woman of modern nursing. She also did analytical studies. She was working in a war zone. She was working in a tent, and she was noticing that when they would bring patients in, they'd have patients come in with fever, throwing up, vomiting, and they'd put them right beside somebody who was there with a gunshot wound who needed maybe an amputation. And she started trying to do kind of a triage and then also a separation. So if that person was feverish and vomiting, she would keep them with other patients who had similar signs or symptoms because she noticed that patients who came in with a gunshot wound that were put near somebody sneezing and vomiting and sick would then, within a few days, have those same symptoms, sneezing and vomiting. So she realized that germs were spreading. So she started trying to separate. So, you know, gunshot wounds had their own ward, and infectious diseases had their own ward. So she started trying to separate patients, and it worked really well. She had a very good survival rate. So an analytical study, again, that was done by Ignaz, is where we're using a controlled study. So remember, analytical study means he had controlled data in front of him. He wasn't out in the field. He was gathering data that had already been collected at a hospital and then using it to prove his point. So he was hand having um, hand washing be proven as being helpful. Another person who did analytical data was Jenner. So remember, Jenner gathered data about cowpox and then from there developed an experiment to test cowpox and smallpox and did the first vaccination, right, vaccination. Okay, so same kind of idea. Um, John Snow was the first to really do a descriptive study where he was out in the field trying to figure out an epidemic that was occurring at the time and trying to stop it. So it was like in real life. So it wasn't just gathering data afterwards, it was like he was in the moment which is what happens when we see things like the virus hunters going out. Like when there's an Ebola outbreak and we have people that zoom there to try to help. So they're the, the true like descriptive epidemiologists. And then Florence Nightingale, she had her comparison of helping, you know, disease, helping people disease people, and then started separating them after reading data and noticing that people were spreading illnesses. And then based on her research, she was able to implement this idea of wards and separate tents depending on what their symptoms were and she did a really good job of getting people isolated and keeping them safe. So if we were to separate out descriptive and analytical then this is just kind of a little rundown. So analytical is kind of like a gathering uh, project. We do a study so we do a controlled setting. 
Um, we're gathering notes and information after a disease has occurred and using that to try to prevent the future. Descriptive is where we're trying to figure out as it's happening. So there's not like a controlled study. We're just out there, we're getting the data as it's coming in and we're fixing things as they move along. So Ignaz, just to go over what he did, again, he was the one who was able to stop childbirth fever. He was referred to as the savior of mothers in Hungary, and he was also invited to go speak to other European countries and help stop the spread of childbirth fever. Um, again, he was just a huge proponent of washing hands and was able to show the data behind it to convince other doctors to start doing it. What's sad is in his 40s, he started showing signs of Alzheimer's, and at that time, they didn't understand Alzheimer's, so he was committed to an insane asylum. And so he ended up dying in an insane asylum because people thought he was crazy, but he was just forgetful. He just had Alzheimer's, unfortunately. So he did all this work and helped all these people and then ended up passing away in kind of a sad situation. John Snow. So John Snow, as I said, was really the first descriptive of the genealogy on the field. And John Snow was a person who followed Pasteur, he believed in germ theory, he followed Pope, and he was living in London, England, when he heard about a Vibrio cholera outbreak. So remember, Vibrio cholera is going to be one of those gamma proteobacteria that are going to infect us through the oral route, meaning that it's through eating or drinking. It usually comes in with contaminated water, the organism moves through our stomachs and colonizes in our small intestine. Now, remember, with cholera, it will not cause illness unless it's lysogenic. What does lysogenic mean? Anybody remember the well, there's something in the bacteria. A virus. Yeah, so lysogenic just means that the bacterium is infected with the virus. So with cholera, it will only really cause an extreme response when it's infected with a virus. So it has to be lysogenic. So what happens with cholera, it moves into our intestines, our body freaks out if it's there, and then we have that intense diarrhea in the rice water stool. If you guys remember that picture that I showed you with the rice water stool. Here's a picture of an infant coming in with cholera, that same infant after treatment with hydration. So you can see how extreme the dehydration can get. And it can actually result in death if they're not treated soon enough. So this child was lucky, they recovered, but it could have easily been the other way. So if they didn't hydrate them soon enough, the child would have died. So with John Snow, when he was looking at London, he heard about this outbreak, and the time when he started investigating, there were already over 600 deaths. So he decided to rush to London and try to see if he could help figure out what was causing these deaths. Now, just to give you an idea of how London was in the 1800s, it was going to be an area where germ theory was not widely accepted. It was also an area where people lived in very crowded conditions. Um, it was not abnormal for people to live, um, basically multiple people in one room. And for example, during a census check one time, they had a five-story building that had over 450 people living in it. That's a whole lot of people living in this little building. And the other thing about that building is it had one water pump. So, you know, you didn't have a sink in your house at this time. You'd have to go out and pump water if you wanted water to take a shower or anything. And it had one privy in the yard. What's a privy? The water pump's this one. A privy is an outhouse. So they had one outhouse for 450 plus people. You know, my house, I have two bathrooms and we all fight over them as it is. I can't imagine 450 people fighting over a bathroom. So what was common then at that time was to have basically a bed pan or a bathroom pan. You would go to the bathroom at home and then you would dump it out your window. And as you can imagine, people below would end up getting this lovely, you know, fecal urine matter kind of in the streets. It wasn't the best of times. We've come a long way since then. As you can imagine then, having feces in the street, so we had horse feces, human feces, urine, all this stuff. It was kind of like going to New Orleans, going, you know, if you've ever gone to New Orleans, it kind of smells like that. Um, it's one of those things where we had a lot of, you know, chances for bacteria to basically be replicating. 
Here's a picture of a water supply. I just I just laugh about New Orleans. I went to Bourbon Street. Have you guys ever heard of Bourbon Street? It's like this big. Yeah, and like you know, you always see in the books, it looks so pretty. If you go wear a clothespin, like you walk in there, it smells like a sewer. It just smells, it smells really bad. I don't know, maybe it was just the time of year I went, but it was like, whoa. It was like I walked down the street and I was like, I'm at Bourbon Street and I'm out. I'm not going to Bourbon Street. It was like that kind of thing. It's like, oh. microbiologist to me said, nope. Okay, so here's the water pump. So they would go and pump water, put it in their buckets, take it upstairs, they heat it for cooking, heat it for baths, whatever they needed. But 450 people were sharing this water supply. So, John Snow's first job was to try to figure out the signs and symptoms of cholera. So he started documenting what people were reporting. They were reporting stomach cramps, they were reporting vomiting, diarrhea. He noted that people who were afflicted showed shriveled skin, they showed blue or cyanin skin. That's because when they get so dehydrated, we see the venation under their skin. And he also noticed that people he interviewed tended to die within about three days from dehydration. He started to suspect it was spread by vomiting, diarrhea, and he started to suspect that it was also spread by contaminated water. The reason he suspected the water supply is when he was investigating and interrogating people who were sick, he couldn't find any commonalities between them other than their water pumps, where they were getting their water sources. That was the only thing they shared. So he started thinking that maybe it was something to do with the water. So in his report, he started trying to figure out who was the first patient who showed signs of illness. And he started asking neighbors when they first heard about cholera arriving. This is referred to in his notes as the index case. And epidemiologists still use this today. Hollywood has heard of this and in their movies like Hot Zone and all these movies. They call it patient zero. So you'll hear the Hollywood term, which is patient zero, which means the person who started it all. In epidemiology world, it's the index case. With talking with neighbors, he found that there was a family that ended up being afflicted with cholera. They were the very first one who reported it. And it was a woman who was taking care of her husband. He'd come home from work sick, vomiting with diarrhea. Their child had gone sick, and she was washing the dirty diapers and his clothing in the well outside in the pump. And so the neighbors recalled seeing all the dirty clothes down on the ground as she was hand washing them all. So he thought, hmm, okay, that's interesting. They also said that she had soaked the diapers in a pail and then emptied it in the privy, the outhouse, and that outhouse was right next to the pump. So he was like, hmm, okay, so maybe something cross-contaminated. He also started looking into who serviced these pumps. And what he found was that there were two water companies for London and that their pipes ran throughout Europe or throughout London and some of the pipes went to some neighborhoods and some of the pipes went to the other neighborhoods. So the next question he started asking was when they got their water bill, who was their water provider? So in other words, he tried to figure out which pump was bringing water into the privies or in, and into the water pump itself. So he gathered all of this data while he's out in the field, he's very, you know, interrogating people, he's asking all of this, and he came up with a map based on all of this information that he was told. Can you go back to that first? Yeah, I got it. This one? Yeah, just first. Okay, you got it. So he came up with a map, and he was able to start documenting on his map where the cases of cholera had occurred, and the water sources, so which water company was providing which water to the wells, and he was able to circle which wells were involved in each situation. So what he found was that there was one area that showed the highest number of cases, and this was referred to as the Broad Street Well. And this was a well that was servicing over those 450 people in that one little apartment, but it was also servicing a lot of the surrounding neighborhood because it was closer than some of the other wells that people would have to walk to. So he started suspecting that maybe it was the well itself that had somehow become contaminated. His idea was that if the mother was washing diapers at that well, then maybe some of the cholera had gotten into the well water and that now every time people pumped, they were getting cholera. 
So he put up a sign to please not use the well. Of course, people would move the sign and keep using it. So he decided he needed to do more. So he went to the city, to the council, with his data, with his map. And he also interviewed people, and he showed that out of all of the victims that were sick or that had died, only 10 households should have been using a pump other than the Broad Street pump. So everybody else had been using the Broad Street pump. He had 10 outliers that he had to explain. Five of these families preferred the taste of the Broad Street pump. So they would have their kids pick up the water on their way to and from school. So they liked the taste of it. Four were children that were sent to school to also use that pump. So we have nine families that he could document why they were going to the Broad Street pump. The 10th family, he never figured out how they got exposed. He still, you know, he just kind of went to and said, look, I can explain nine of them, I can't explain the 10th, but here's my data. So they listened to him and the neighborhood council decided that they would remove the handle from the water pump that was servicing all these areas. And if you go to London today, if you go to Broad Street, which is still there, there is a bronze water pump that was left in his honor with a little plaque that says about Jon Snow, the first true epidemiologist. So you can actually go there and he is memorized there or memorialized there, which is pretty cool. And they preserved one of the original pumps and bronzed it to save it. So once they removed the water handle, the water pump, people couldn't remove a sign and use it anyway because they moved the pump so they couldn't even use it. And all of a sudden the cases dropped immediately. So that was a success. However, they still had a few cases cropping up occasionally in the city. So he was called back in by the city council and they said, well, why are we still seeing cases? So then he started looking at his data, and he started trying to explain why new outbreaks would occur. And remember he had his map of the water sources, like where the water pumps were coming from, right? The water lines. So now he went and he started monitoring the two water companies that service London, and he mapped their water intakes. And what he found was that of the two water companies that service London, one of them, the Lambert Company, had a pipeline that went to the Thames River. And in that river, its pipeline, where it would pull water from the river, was upstream of a sewage line. So let me draw this on the board. So I have the Lambert Company here. I have the Thames River here. And I have a pipeline here, and water's getting pulled from the river and then going to all over um, different parts of London. So it's getting pulled from the river, okay? So he found that this company had fairly clean water. I mean, you know, the water wasn't ever pristine, but it was fairly clean. Then here, there was a sewage dump line. Okay, so sewage that was collected from the city was kind of in a runoff trough, and the runoff troughs would go towards the river, and then they would get washed away by the river. That's how they kept their city clean. And then guess where Southwark was? Southwark was down here with their intake line. Do you guys see a problem with this? And our river's <laughs> flowing like this. Okay, is there an issue here? Yes. Yeah. So what he found then was that the cases of cholera that were still occurring was because the sewage line was dumping here, that sewage would then get pulled into the drinking water. And he was able to prove this by doing another map to show which company was servicing which region and was able to show that all of the new outbreaks were related to this company. That was pretty smart. You know, I wouldn't have thought of that. That was pretty brilliant. So now what they did is they asked the water companies if they could work together to move this line. And so what they did is LC agreed to let the South Wall put a line on the opposite side. And so they moved their source from near the sewage line to go upstream. So they reorganized it up here. Now we're getting cleaner water. And so all of a sudden his outbreak stopped completely. That was a first successful epidemiologist. So that was a huge, huge thing. Everybody was very thrilled. The last person we'll talk about is Florence Nightingale. And as I mentioned, 
She is really credited for being a modern nurse. Um, she's the one that really kind of started triage. She's the one that noticed that hospital conditions were unsanitary, that patients were being left in their own blood. Um, she came in and she was like, no, we can't do this. We need to clean the patients, change the sheets. We need to take care of them, keep them healthy as possible. She started trying to separate patients into separate tent wards. So she had multiple tents on the battlefield. And she had a gunshot tent. She had a cholera tent. She had a typhoid fever tent. And then the nurses would stay in those tents. They wouldn't cross back and forth. So that also prevented cross-contamination. So because of this, she was able to show that infections were preventable. And so with her work, you know, other doctors started kind of looking at this, other nurses looked at this, and she's kind of the one that led the way to the practices that we see today. So epidemiology still follows the process that Snow and Samwise and Florence Nightingale put into place. Um, I had a student of mine who went to a wedding and ate oysters and ended up getting exposed to Vibrio cholera. And so they were out for like about a week with cholera poisoning and they were in a hospital down at Santa Barbara uh, Cottage Hospital. And they said that they had an epidemiologist sent to them from the CDC who sat there and interrogated everything they had eaten for the past week, which I can't remember what I ate yesterday. So I was impressed that they could remember what they ate for a week. I mean, that would be hard. And then, yeah, he's like, hmm. And then what they found out was that the cases that were occurring in the region of Santa Barbara, Ventura, and LA, they were all people who had been to the same wedding. And they were all people who had eaten the same oysters at the wedding. And then they tracked the oysters to a provider in Oregon. They tested that facility and they found cholera in about 60% of their oysters. So they had been filter feeding in the water. Somehow they ended up having cholera nearby. They think probably a cruise liner had dumped fecal matter in the ocean and it was too close to the shore. So the oysters ended up getting exposed. So they had to put up a huge sign to say no eating of the shellfish. And then that oyster farm had to cull their oysters. They had to get rid of the ones that had been exposed. But still, how amazing is it that they figured that all out? So it was really neat having the student in my class because she was like keeping me updated on all the events and she got like an official letter, like a report saying what they found, which I thought was pretty cool. I was like, that's awesome. It's like, you're part of history. How cool is that? You know? <laughs> I don't think she thought it was that cool. I was the one that thought it was cool. Okay, so these are some reportable illnesses. So you might be wondering, well, if I go into the doctor's office and I have a cold, you know, do they report that to the CDC? And the answer is no. If it's a common cold, no, we don't care. I don't care. We don't want you to be sick, but it's not going to get reported. But we do want to know about specific diseases. So COVID, for example, is reported. Uh, chlamydia is reported. West Nile is reported. Chickenpox is reported. SARS is reported. Q fever. Um, let's see. MERS is reported. Rabies is reported. It gives us an idea for our morbidity and mortality reports so that we can keep track and see if there's any increases. Um, influenza is reported. That helps us determine if we need to develop any kind of special vaccines or shots for that year. If we need a booster shot. Eric. I don't see MRSA on this list out there. Do I not have MRSA? So. Let's see. Do I have staff in here? I have VERSA. Hmm. VERSA is vancomycin. So maybe they haven't, maybe they aren't having us report MRSA anymore. They might just have us reporting Vanco. So, because the difference between the two is MRSA is methicillin resistant and VERSA is vancomycin resistant. And so with the MRSA one, it's not as serious because I could treat with Vanco. Yeah. With Vanco, it's more serious because that's kind of my last big gun that I can use for treatment. So they might have dropped MRSA and just have MRSA on here. So thank you for pointing that out. I should read my own stuff, shouldn't I? <laughs> so I have to like, but looking at this list, don't memorize it. I'm just showing you all of the ones that are reportable. In case you're ever curious. And then, of course, another thing that the CDC keeps track of is what factors can lead to the spread of disease. So they look at things like how old people are. That kind of lets us know like which groups are more at risk. So like with COVID, you know the elderly are more at risk. Um, they start to look at things like um, whether or not uh, gender has an effect. You know, if you're male or female, does that have an effect on how you respond to illness? Um, what your race or genetic factors are. We have to be really careful with this one, with the race and genetic factors, because our population is becoming more blended. And nowadays, we can't just use race as a way to rule things out. 
used to, there were certain illnesses that were um, associated, for example, with African Americans. Americans and certain illnesses associated with the Jewish community and certain illnesses associated with Caucasian. Now they're all blended together. There was a great example of this in Texas. There was a, um, a little girl who was two who was African American. She was having a failure to thrive. She kept coming in with asthma attacks. And they had taken an x ray of her lungs. They had it up on the screen. And a doctor walked by and looked at her picture of her lungs and goes, Oh, this little girl has cystic fibrosis. And the doctor that was treating her looked at him and says, she doesn't have cystic fibrosis, she's African-American. And the, he looked at him and said, I don't care if she's purple or whatever, you know, that's cystic fibrosis on the x-ray, you can tell from the inflammation. But the doctor, the previous doctor, had ruled it out based on her race. And you, you just can't do that anymore. Used to, we didn't see cystic fibrosis carried in African-Americans, but we've had mixtures of genes, so now they do. So we have to be really careful with that. And there's a big push right now in the medical community to try to take out these race questions because we feel like it's almost like putting blinders on the doctors. Because yes. like you put everybody in a box and it doesn't always, that's not exactly. how it works. Exactly, exactly. We're not, we're not box people. We are all beautiful blend, right? So we're all a little bit different. So it's kind of used to, that was a little something the doctors would use to try to isolate things out, but it just doesn't work anymore. It's not effective. So we're trying to get rid of that. Um, immune status, you know, what kind of vaccines they've had, nutritional status, you know, if they're healthy, what their diet is. Behavior, are they sedentary, are they active, um, are they outdoors engaging with people, are they home alone, like what's their activity, and then what else have they been exposed to. So with epidemiologists today then, we've kind of been seeing epidemiology in action with our COVID outbreaks. We have some leaders who have been identified as the, you know, ones to keep us posted on the disease. So one of the ones with COVID has been Fossey. Right? He's been kind of the, the spokesperson for the science. Um, they are trying to identify the causes of the disease. They're trying to isolate patients. And it's hard when you're trying to, as I said before, build an air, uh, airplane and fly it at the same time. We have mistakes. So originally with COVID, one of the big mistakes we said was that we didn't have to wear masks. We found out that that wasn't good because it was being spread easier without mask use. So CDC changed their stance and said wear masks. Unfortunately, then, as more information was found, the CDC was kind of caught where they would say something and then they'd find information contradicting and they'd have to change it. And that also, unfortunately, has led to a lot of mistrust now. So now the CDC, which used to be like, you know, kind of revered, is now looked at as, well, they make a lot of mistakes. And, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, but still, they're just trying to find information on the fly. So they're doing the best they can with what they have. And as we get more information, then they can make a better informed, a better informed decision. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things where sometimes it's hard to give a statement before you're ready. You just don't have the data. Yeah. So because everything got so political, yes. I feel like they tried to, like, stay away from the whole fact that, that we do have to hold China responsible for not allowing CDC who all that to go. Right. Because they didn't do that, I feel like they should have said, hey, we would have known more had we been able to do that. And then you guys would have trusted us more. We're going off of, we don't have testing because we don't know what to test for. Right. We ran out of masks. Like, being in the healthcare industry, I understood. But I could see the layperson not understanding because they don't get how all of that works. Right. They don't understand. And because the media totally, like asked anybody that said anything in regards to China. Right. It wasn't a racial thing. It was like, hey, this nation, this is where it kind of leaked out of however it did. Right. They didn't want to recognize it because they felt like, oh, everything's a racial issue because everything was so overly sensitive, like overly sensitive, can't say anything, right. like walking on eggshells. So I feel like that was where the root of mistrust came from because how are you supposed to know, hey, this is what this disease is or virus, or this is how we, usually we have a handle on how to get ahead of it. Right. They didn't have a chance to do that. Right. And I, I think that that is a good point, and that's something that... That's just, that's what goes through my mind. Yeah, and they're still kind of leaning, trying to figure out what to do about that, because 
whether or not China developed the illness in a class four lab, which they're you know they're thinking that they there's a lot of evidence that it happened that way, but they're still going they're still trying to figure this out. Um, because a lot of evidence was destroyed because right. they couldn't get in there for a year. But regardless of how it started, the truth is that China knew it was there at least in October. They knew for sure it was there. And so kind of like the WHO, the European you know, Union, Canadian Union, they're all saying, why didn't you tell us? You know, and what are the repercussions of not telling us? Because, you know, when SARS came out in 2004, they did do it right. They warned the nation. And so everybody was ready. And so, again, we don't we don't really know what to do with that. We've never had a situation like this. So a precedent has been set, and they're still trying to figure out what, what to do with it. It's kind of too late to do too much. It's like when it rolls down and it just keeps getting right. the dumpster fire and it right. just doesn't stop. I think the biggest thing at this point is to kind of stop worrying about pointing fingers and just say, okay, going forward, let's do right. better. You know, going forward, let's make sure we're much more open and we inform each other and just let's, you know, not worry about pointing a finger and saying, no, this nation did this. It's like, just stop and let's just say, okay, going forward from this point on, let's do this. Let's do the right thing. So a couple of quick questions. What is the CDC's function? When you hear CDC, what do you think of that? It's the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Excellent. Yeah, we're going to try to stop that. Well, it's disease control and prevention. Yeah. Their job is to gather data. Their job is to protect us. Their job is to share that data. Um, what is an epidemiologist function? What's their job? Exactly. If they're a descriptive epidemiologist, they are out in the field. They are tracking the virus. If they're an analytical epidemiologist, they're doing studies. They're trying to figure out how it spreads. So both of these are doing, you know, the same kind of resource work, but they're doing it a different way. Descriptive, I'm in the field, analytical, I'm home doing controlled studies. So when we're doing like our vaccine studies, that's all going to be analytical. When we're out in the field gathering data, that's descriptive. Yeah. Do the CDC that's located, whether it's here in Texas and then the one in China, do they work together or does China reserve a right to want to like hold back on the stating anything because Right. If you state something, I would imagine that at that point you're gonna almost like activate this emergency action plan, and people tend to we, we, we get scared. Right. So right. Exactly. So then I would imagine they want to try to contain it as much as possible before in igniting any fear. So that is the whole reason why we're supposed to have a CDC representative in Wuhan or in areas that have class four labs. Oh, so okay. then that person is not under China's law or any country's law. They're under the CDC law. Right. So that's why if there's a class four lab somewhere, we're supposed to have a CDC representative nearby. But with budget cuts, we're not doing that. And that's something that this was also kind of a wake up call. Yeah. A lot of um, class four labs in the US. We have two main class four labs. We have one in Texas and we have one that's over in Atlanta. We also have another one that's in a military base that's closer to the New York region. Um, we also have another one that's unofficial, it's in LA. So we do, we do have class fours kind of all around, but we have two official ones, and that's the Texas and the Atlanta one. The other ones are military based ones. So we don't really know what they have, they're, they're military. Um, class fours. In China, they have a lot of class fours. And so that's why we're supposed to have you know, people that are stationed there, because they are doing a lot of research on viruses. So the take home message then is that we are always finding new diseases, new viruses, new bacteria. They're always out there. Um, and we're kind of always in a race with our microbes. There is this idea that epidemiologists, or the term that epidemiologists use, that's referred to as the Red Queen hypothesis. And the Red Queen hypothesis comes from the book Alice in Wonderland. And if you've ever read Alice in Wonderland or uh, Through the Looking Glass, there's a line there where they are running in a circle. They're doing a race. And Alice asks them why they're running. And they say, well, you have to run to stay in place because the world is moving. And if you're not running, you can't keep up. So the Red Queen hypothesis is saying that we are running to keep up with bacteria that are mutating. And the bacteria are always mutating and they're always a step ahead of us. So in other words, we're running, we're creating antivirals, we're creating antibiotics, we're creating new drugs. 
and we're running as fast as we can, but no matter how far we run, the bacteria are always ahead of us because they're mutating, they're changing, they're evolving, and we just never can get ahead. So we're running to stay in place effectively. Um, remember, not all bacteria out there are bad. Um, I had this link up here because the CDC, that one of the epidemiologists who's in charge of the CDC, his job is to come up with emergency response plans. And his kids had told him he had the most boring job in the world. <laughs> so about six years ago on the CDC website for Halloween, he did a zombie plan for the globe. And if you pulled it up, it was an official CDC plan. Like if you typed in Ebola, it brings up an official plan. Yeah. If you typed in zombies, it brought up an official plan. And he did it for his kids to show them the science was not boring. And it was just hilarious. He had like bunkers set up. He was telling people to go to Costco's to build a bunker at Costco because they had everything you need there. It was just awesome. It was really fun. Now if you click on it, it brings up the link to a living dead. So it's not as exciting because they, they kind of based on the show Living Dead, but I liked the old thing. It was pretty funny. I mentioned it to one of my doctors when I was in there um, one time, and they were like, there is not a link on CDC, and they looked it up. They're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And you're like printing it out to show it to all the families. Okay, so that gets us through epidemiology. That is the end of our exam material. So that will be the um, basis of what we're going to be covering for our exam. So let's go ahead and start. We have a little bit of time. Let's go ahead and start our next chapter, which is innate immunity. Do you guys want to start it or do you want to stop here? Stop. Is that kind of a silly question? Everybody's like, oh, we're going to stop. Okay, I'll tell you what. 10 of 7, we don't need to talk for 10 minutes. I'll go ahead and let it slide on this one. Now we don't get confused. All right. So with that in mind, then how about if we start a lab at 10.20? Okay. Sound good? Yes. All right, so we'll start a lab at 10.20.